get started and get right into it. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I am the executive director of Black and Beyond Binary. Um, here we go. Okay. I am the uh, director for Black and Beyond the Binary um, Collective. We're dedicated to the advocacy and healing uh, for transgender and gender variant Oregonians who are Black and have lived experiences as members of the African diaspora. Um, tonight, we also are um, joined by the Emoja Kijana Shuja Youth. Um, Emoja Kijana Shuja uh, addresses anti-Blackness as a global epidemic and that it's the basis for oppression of all people under white supremacist imperialism and colonization. In a world that seeks to destroy and control all aspects of Black life, we must create space to heal intergenerationally through community connection. The Emoja Kijana Shuja program is a program for Black liberation through youth leadership offered every year here in Portland, Oregon. Um, for young folks between the ages of 14 and 24. So I wanna just provide a little bit of context about like why we're even at this conversation. You're like, who are you? I don't know who you are. So just a little bit of that. Um, so for the overview of this event, um, we're essentially gonna do a little bit of background and hear uh, from one of the Emoja organizers. Um, Tana Barnett and give a little bit of background about like kind of the lay of the land um, in Portland and Oregon and some of the history. Uh, and then we are going to be uh, chatting with Zach um, about uh, the book, We Keep Us Safe, as well as some of the work uh, that they've been involved with in Ella Baker Center um, in California. Um, and then we'll round out the conversation, um, having a conversation, I mean, round out the conversation um, with Denasia, who is another one of our uh, Emoja organizers, and is gonna talk a little about the work and campaign work that Emoja has done and is currently involved in right now. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A um, and wrap it up. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully, um, it's a good flow for everyone. And uh, yeah, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but I will uh, just kind of like introduce um, Tana a little bit, I guess. Uh, Tana is a black queer person who has lived on the outskirts of East Portland, Oregon for their entire life. Um, their first experience with organizing came from advocating for youth voice and educational access for students living in the city's least privileged schools. An Emoja alum with a background in education, social work, counseling, and addiction services, Tana is primarily interested in finding ways to help community members unite and address the root causes of violence and inequities in their neighborhoods. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Tana. Hey all, that's me. Um, I'm Tana, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm an organizer with Emoja Kajana Shuja. As Tunde said, I'm here to give a little background in order to ground this conversation in the history of our city. So those of us who went to school here in the state likely heard once or twice that Oregon was never a slaveholding territory. This is true, but this attitude wasn't based in morality or respecting the autonomy of a whole race of kidnapped people. Founding Oregonians just wanted nothing to do with black folks, free or enslaved. In fact, Oregon was the only state to join the union as neither a free state nor a slave state, but a no black state. Case in point are exclusion laws. In 1843, pre-statehood, white Oregonians voted to prohibit slavery and indentured servitude, except as punishment for convicted crimes. Later, this law was modified to give slaveholders a three-year time limit to remove their kidnapped black folks or else they would be free. Don't get too excited though. These former slaves may have gotten their first taste of freedom on this unceded soil, but if they were willing or unable, unwilling or unable to leave the territory within another two to three years, they were subject to Peter Burnett's lash law, which specified the infliction of 20 to 39 lashes repeated every six months or until they got out of Dodge. This law was never enforced and quickly repealed, but thanks to its harsh nature, it wasn't forgotten. In 1849, also pre-statehood, 
black folks were barred from entering or residing in Oregon territory unless they were already established. When the state constitution was ratified in 1857, it incorporated a clause prohibiting black folks from entering, living in, or acquiring work contracts in our state. So to fast forward like another century and ground it specifically in Portland, prior to World War II, Portland was home to a population of just over 2,000 black residents. The great migration of the 1940s was to change all this as many black families left the South in search of better opportunities afforded to them by the increased industrialization during the war. In my family, we left the South for the Midwest and the West Coast respectively. A lot of black folks that have been in Portland for one or more generations can trace their family's presence in the city back to the Kaiser shipyards or the Union rail yards as these fields encompass nearly all of the jobs available to black folks in the city. The population boom plus the no Negroes allowed attitude led to the construction of several housing projects on the West Coast meant to entice and retain working families. Here in Portland, this led to the construction of Vanport, a city constructed on the floodplains between Portland and Vancouver. It's pretty wild how infrequently Vanport is mentioned when people talk about Oregon history because the housing project turned miniature city has had a major impact on Portland and Portland culture. Vanport was home to the Vanport Extension Center, also called Vanport College for short. Today, this institution is known as Portland State University. The Vanport Interracial Council also helped establish Portland's Urban League office. And possibly most notably, Vanport itself was segregated. Only 50 homes were allotted for black folks to reside in across three specific sections of the project. Over 40,000 people lived in this mini city at its peak. This was higher than the population of Portland was at that time. And 25% of its population was black compared to 5.3% of modern Portland. This led to 25, or this 25% led to Vanport being referred to as the Negro Project by many. So where did it go? After the war, populations and temporary housing began to plummet. By 1948, Vanport's population had dwindled to 20,000 with about 5,000 black folks still remaining. Conversations about demolishing the project picked up steam with many residents of Portland proper referring to Vanport as a slum and an eyesore. The Housing Authority of Portland was quoted in 1947 saying that Vanport would continue to operate whether Portland likes it or not due to the physical impossibility of throwing 20,000 people out on the street. A major flood in May of 1948 rendered this conversation moot. All of the hastily built and poorly maintained structures suffered significant damage, effectively displacing this large population. 15 people died and over 5,300 families were displaced, about 1,000 of them black families, including my grandmother and her siblings. Families that weren't able to squeeze into housing with friends and extended family in the city or elsewhere were relegated to trailers and temporary housing in industrial areas like Swan Island and Guilds Lake. Black families that had the means settled primarily in the Albina neighborhood, especially clustered around the previously established, although much smaller, Black community along North Williams Avenue. The Housing Authority of Portland took this opportunity to redline the Black population into this area. Certain parts of the city were reserved for Black folks and other people of color in order to prevent race mixing on grounds that integrated neighborhoods caused property values to plummet. There are racist clauses written into the deeds for many historical homes and plots of land, barring Black and Asian folks from occupying or owning property in areas like Laurelhurst. Parts of the city which were open to Black residents were zoned for multifamily housing and businesses, while other more desirable parts of the city were zoned for single-family homes. Property values in these melting pots, as the multifamily zones were referred to, did indeed decrease over time thanks to the effects of redlining preventing residents in these areas from accessing mortgages, loans, and other community aid services needed to maintain their communities. So, Portland also has a long and fairly well-known history of gentrification and displacement. A large wave of displacement occurred during the construction of the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, AKA the Rose Quarter or Moda Center, in the expansion of I-5. At this point in time, the city went into planning mode in order to expand Legacy Emanuel Hospital. This planning went on for about a decade and plans were submitted to and approved by the city with almost no warning to the community. Residents weren't able to give testimony until 1970 when city commissioners voted to approve the plans. 
55.3 acres of primarily black homes and businesses were sold to the hospital. Over 300 homes and businesses were raised for the legacy expansion, but the hospital was never built. The Emanuel Displaced Persons Association was organized in August of 1970 by a group of former residents who said the relocation plans were unfair, compensation for their homes was inadequate, and the city failed to thoroughly explain their plans. Homes were appraised lower than their actual value, and although the HUD paid the difference for residents to purchase comparable homes in other areas, the practice of redlining still hadn't, hadn't died out, and few areas were open to Black homeowners, forcing the previously tight-knit community to spread out across the metro area. In the mid to late 90s, young white couples and families from less segregated cities began to move into the historically Black Albina district due to the lower property costs compared to the rest of Portland. As they moved in and added their voices to the Black folks in the area who were advocating for more community maintenance services and help mitigating the damage caused by a lack of financial resources and assistance as well as hate and survival crimes, the city took an interest in renewing the district and predatory flippers began lowballing desperate homeowners by offering cash payments for these houses. In 2000, the city implemented its Interstate Corridor Urban Renewal Plan, which strove to prevent the displacement of residents and ensure the construction of 2000 affordable housing units in the area. These goals were not reached. This is what began the current wave of gentrification that saw 8,900 Black folks move from the area between 2000 and 2014. And despite increased awareness about the issue, these trends have continued to force Black residents out to the outskirts of the city into tributary cities such as Gresham and Beaverton. So now that we've set the stage for the violent histories of gentrification, displacement, and redlining, let's talk about the violence our city has been so shaken by this summer. Portland has drawn national attention in the last couple of years for a few reasons. For protests against Trump's election and presidency, protests in solidarity with Ferguson, the racially motivated 2017 Mac stabbing, and most recently, the 100 plus days of protesting in response to the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and other black folks killed by police, mostly centered around those from other states. Our police force has gained a national reputation for the often brutal treatment of protesters advocating against racist policing and police violence. There has been a trend of black protesters being hit with much harsher charges, as well as being approached by federal officers. At the same time, rallies held by white supremacist groups have received protection and special privileges, such as shuttle buses commandeered from TriMet and the opportunity to fire non-lethal projectiles into crowds of protesters from the rooftops of parking garages. The presence of feds in the city has created a culture of fear. Meanwhile, to quote the Oregonian, in 2020, more shootings have occurred almost every month when compared to last year. In 2019, about 30 to 40 shootings happened each month. So far this year, it's been up to 40 to 50 a month. Five people died of homicidal violence in the two days between July 9th and July 11th. My own experience, I've lived in the same apartment complex for two years. This year marked the first shooting I've witnessed on our block, and since then, there have been two more. Meanwhile, police forces are focusing on the downtown areas surrounding the Justice Center, which is the epicenter of the protests, looting, and property damage, but hardly the epicenter of this summer's violence against humans. PPB has also been called out for their excessive use of crowd control devices, such as flashbangs, tear gas, and pepper balls in residential areas. These pepper balls especially are a cause for concern because they don't always explode on impact and can pose a hazard for pedestrians and animals. But all of these devices are extremely unhealthy for the environment and thus for the people who live in these areas. Before I pass it back to Zach and Babatunde, I'd like to take a moment to uplift the spirit of Aja Ra Raquel Roan Spears, who was killed late in July following a vic vigil for a victim of gun violence. Aja was stabbed to death in the midst of an argument, but before that, she was a vibrant part of Portland's Black trans community, and we honor her. If it is within your means, please consider sending a Cash App donation to either of Aja's sisters. I'll drop their cash tags in the chat. With that, I'll pass it off to y'all, Zach and Tunde. Okay, 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 okay. 
Um, thank you, Tana. That was powerful. And I think it's really, really important um, to lift up your history to know where you came from so you know where you're going. Um, I do just want to take a moment and see if we can take a moment of silence for uh, Aja, who um, Tana just mentioned. Thank you again, Tana. Um, okay, so definitely, definitely highlighting some of the challenges we've been experiencing here in the city of Portland just this year, and even some um, dating back further than that. Um, so I wanna switch gears a little bit and shift into uh, some solutions um, about how we can potentially address some of these things. Um, and so I just want to give a quick and brief introduction uh, for Zach. Um, Zach Norris is the executive director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and co-founder of Restore Oakland, a community advocacy and training center that will empower Bay Area community members to transform local economic and justice systems and make a safe, secure future possible for them and for their families. Zach is also a co-founder of the Justice for Families, a national alliance of family-driven organizations working to end our nation's youth uh, incarceration epidemic. Zach helped build California's first statewide network for families of incarcerated youth, which led the efforts to close five youth prisons in the state, wow, um, pass legislation to enable families to stay, to stay in contact with their loved ones and defeated Prop 9, a destructive and ineffective criminal justice ballot measure. In addition to being a Harvard graduate and NYU educated attorney, Zach is also a graduate of the Labor Community Strategy Center's National School for Strategic Organizing in Los Angeles, California, say that five times fast, and was a 2011 Soros Justice Fellow. He's a former board member at uh, Witness for Peace, just Cause Oakland and Just for Families. Zach was the recipient of the American Con uh, Constitution Society David Carliner Public Interest Award in 2015 and is a member of the 2016 class of the Levi Strauss Foundation's Pioneers of Justice. Zach is also a loving husband and dedicated father of two bright daughters whom he is raising in his home town of Oakland, California. Um, so thank you for joining us, Zach. Um, I'll just stop you, there. Yeah, but you. <laughs> Sorry, I need to cut down the bio. I appreciate um, the introduction. Um, I want to thank you, Baba Tunde. I want to thank uh, Sandra and Meg for bringing this together as well. Thank you, Commissioner Udaley, for the warm introduction and for reading the book. I appreciate it. I also want to thank Tana um, for giving us a history of Oregon and Portland. Um, so much of what you said really resonated with me in terms of the history of Oakland, um, uh, from the shipyards to the redlining and the racially restrictive covenants. Um, I was born uh, in 1977 in San Francisco, California, and we moved to Oakland when I was a week old. I like to say it was a week too late because I just love Oakland that much. Um, so I am going to slow down a little bit because I want to remind myself that we have an interpreter to make sure that um, the interpretation and the interpreter is able to do their work. Uh, Baba Tunde, should I just go ahead and, and talk a little bit about the book? Is that all right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the questions that I had uh, first is really what inspired you to write the book and really what does safety mean to you? Right on, I appreciate that question. Um, and it's a question that I often ask. And so I'll ask you all to just think about for a moment, a time when you felt safe. Um, and if you want to close your eyes, um, here in Oakland, the sky has been yellow all day, so it's been a little bit strange and disconcerting, um, given climate change and wildfires that I know that you all are experiencing in Oregon as well. 
Um, and so uh, remembering what it feels like to, to be safe is important. Um, and when I ask that question of people, a lot of times people say, um, I felt safe with my family, be they biological or chosen, or I felt safe in a faith community, or I felt safe um, when I was surrounded by uh, those who love me. Um, my grandmother recently passed and I um, remember feeling safe when she would hold my hands because she had this way of holding my hands with both of her hands. With one hand, she would hold my hand. With the other hand, she would just kind of gently tap my little fingers. And it was this reminder for me that she had my back. Um, she had my back when I did well, but also she had my back if I made a mistake that she was going to hold me accountable and yet still hold me in her love and hold me uh, within a uh, community. And that is what I think safety should really be about is us being able to hold each other accountable while still holding each other in community. Um, I wrote this book because I wanted to um, really put that vision of what safety looks like and how we get there into book form. And if I'm being real though, there are two different versions of, of why I, I wrote this book. There's the before November 8th, 2016 version, and there's the after November 8th, 2016 version. And I'm sure you all are familiar with that date, but before November 8th, 2016, um, we lived in a country that seemed dedicated to uh, policies that resulted in the death of black and brown people. And I say that um, as someone who is from this country, is from Oakland, and is proud of where I'm from. But at the same time, ever since I've been born in 1977, uh, what we have seen is that two things are always recession proof in this country, and that is policing and that is prisons. And so when we saw recessions in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, recessions in, in this century, each time we saw those recessions, the, the things that never got cut and often got more funding were policing and prisons um, and the military. So 53 cents of every federal dollar goes to the military. States like California from 1980 to 2000 built 23 new prisons and just one new university. Cities like Oakland and others in Portland and so many spend the lion's share of their resources on policing. Meanwhile, our social safety net is in tattered ruins. As Reverend William Barber says, um, there are uh, those things that accelerate the, the morbidity and mortality of, of black and brown people. Uh, through their, their policies and their actions, policing and prisons being chief among them. But there are also these things that he calls the death measures on the download, right? So for every half a million people who don't have health care, I think it's some 1,800 people will die. That some 700 people die every day because of hunger and poverty. And so these death measures on the, the download, um, these... Uh, this continued funding of policing and prisons uh, has deeply impacted our society. Thankfully, um, even prior to um, November 8th, 2016, people were starting to wake up and realize that mass incarceration was a problem. And you had people across the political spectrum actually recognizing this problem from Michelle Alexander to Newt Gingrich saying, we have too many prisons, we need to do something about it. Now, some meaningful reforms were happening, but there wasn't a lot of vision around 2010, 2011, 2012 around what would a world without mass incarceration look like? And so, uh, one example of how we were experiencing this was seeing um, that we had won this victory in Alameda County to shift resources away from the Sheriff and Probation Department and towards community-based re-entry supports for, for people coming out of the jail. So not Sheriff and Probation and jail, but yes, let's fund job opportunities, educational opportunities for people coming out of the jail. 
So we thought, yes, this is a great victory. $10 million new funding um, for, for programs to actually help people who have been impacted by the war on drugs, who have been impacted by um, mass incarceration. So we counted our, our chickens before they hatched, so to speak, right? Because what we found is that Alameda County was giving those resources to the nonprofit agencies that were very good at responding to the RFPs, the requests for proposals, but not very good at actually responding to the community. And so um, they were promising job training, but not really connecting people to jobs. And so we thought, you know what? Everybody needs the visual aid. So when we, um, what we decided to do was build an 18,000 square foot vision of uh, community safety that we call Restore Oakland. And I um, will try to share my screen um, just to give you a quick sense of what it looks like. Um, this is Restore Oakland. Um, and it is a home for restorative and transformative justice to hold people accountable while still holding them in community. It's a home for economic opportunity for people to advance their careers into um, to real meaningful work. It's a, a space where Causa Husha Just Cause, a housing rights organization, is fighting gentrification and is fighting to keep people in their homes. And so it is for us a vision of community safety, but also a vision of community economic development to, to Tana's point about needing to be able to keep black and brown folks here in the Bay Area. And so that building is only one building, right? It's 18,000 square feet and it is one idea, but there are so many amazing community driven safety solutions that we need to be lifting up and pushing forward. And so We Keep Us Safe, Building Secure, Just, and Inclusive Communities is a book that really highlights all of those um, stories and all of that work that is happening across the country from Durham, North Carolina to Richmond, California. People are leading community-centered um, safety solutions. And I wanted to lift those up with We Keep Us Safe. Um, so I'll just briefly say, because I don't want to leave y'all hanging, that that was the before November 8th, 2016, reason why I wrote the book. But I continued to write the book under the Trump administration. And after November 8th, 2016, I started to see the relationship between our vision of safety and our very democracy, or what, what, what remains of it, right? Because we have never had uh, 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 a fully functional democracy, in my mind, in this country. Um, and, and in Portland, you all know this, you all have seen the impacts, the multiple impacts of, of surging and rising fascism and white supremacy, not just in the last hundred days, obviously, but the last hundred years and more, as Tana described. What we have seen in this administration is that if you can demonize people, you can disenfranchise them. And we know that has a long history also in this country. But what Trump has been doing is applying that same logic to entire cities, to entire political parties. Um, rather than recognizing climate change as a real thing, he says, well, that's the problem of the Democratic governor in California who doesn't seem to clear the underbrush or whatever he's saying to basically blame uh, Governor Newsom. He has been blaming city mayors across, um, the, across the country for violence that he himself has instigated and fomented using the military, as you all have clearly seen, using um, and, and, and allowing and instigating the violence of right-wing militias. And so that same logic that was at play when we were demonizing the so-called youth super predators when I was a high school student in Oakland, California, when we were demonizing mothers um, in the 80s, calling them welfare queens and worse, that same logic is now being applied to entire political parties who he is saying will fundamentally cheat. That they, if they win, it is because they cheated, much like when folks said if welfare queens were doing well, it was because they were cheating the system. And so we um, uh, have seen that this 
um, idea of uh, safety really isn't based in safety. It is based in uh, the, the, the notion that one person can keep us safe. And it is fundamentally an abusive lie. I call it the he keeps us safe lie. Because while Trump is proclaiming to protect us, he is actually allowing the harms to continue within our communities from climate change to growing inequality. And so what I wanted to do with this book is really compare and contrast this he keeps us safe lie of would-be dictators with the we keep us safe truth that is grounded in public health and that is grounded in common sense. So I'll stop there because I know I've been talking for a minute. I appreciate that, Zach. Thanks for making those points. I really, really like the he keeps us safe lie. Like, I think that's a really, really great way to put that. Um, I guess in terms of like keeping us safe in this current political moment with everything that's going on, like why do you feel like there's so much urgency around the call for defund as opposed to um, outright naming like abolition? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the call to defund the police is resonating with so many people because quite frankly, policing has not made us safe in this country. And that is especially true when it comes to black and brown people um, and communities of color. But it is also true if you are a worker and you are demanding a living wage, the police are being sent out to break up the strike and they are not breaking it up on the behalf of people who are demanding a live living wage to be able to pay to put food on their tables, regardless of skin color. And it's our sheriffs across the, the, the country who are evic evicting people. Um, they aren't doing so on the behalf of tenants. They are doing so on behalf of landlords. And so when we talk about police accountability, we have to take a step back even from just the notions of brutality and understand what does accountability mean? It means accountability to a certain set of laws and regulations. And quite frankly, when we have seen, you know, ongoing and continuing, as I mentioned, uh, decimation of, of public health infrastructure, um, social safety net programs being cut, um, the, the continued spending on policing in prisons, um, we, what, what that means is that we don't have the public health infrastructure we need to be safe. And COVID-19 really exposed this um, and made this very clear and apparent, I think should be to all of us. Um, in ways that continue to disproportionately um, hurt black and brown people, to hurt us first and worst. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why I think the, the call to defund the police is so resonant is because people are saying we need to actually fund communities. We need the things that make communities safe. When I think about the safest communities in Oakland, I actually think about Piedmont, which is not part of Oakland. It's basically an enclave, a city that created its own borders within Oakland and said, we're going to have our own public school system and we're going to keep folks from Oakland effectively out. Um, and Piedmont is not safe because it has, you know, a huge police force. It's safe because young people have a future that they um, understand is ahead of them and 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 their parents have good jobs and good opportunities and those things that are um, relevant for safety in that zip code are relevant across Oakland and across the country and so what we're saying in terms of really calling out um, the need to defund the police is really to say that public health solutions to public health issues work that when someone is suicidal um, it doesn't make sense to send people armed with guns to respond. That mental health crises should be dealt with with mental health solutions. That school discipline should be dealt with through a public health approach. That traffic violations and drug use abuse and abuse. These are public health issues that can be dealt with through a public health approach. Now, those are sort of the easy ones in my mind, but um, also, I want to say that police aren't getting to the root of violence in our communities. Um, and I would lift up the story of Richmond, California as an example of a city that took a different approach 
um, to ongoing violence within that city. Around the turn of the century, um, in 2005, Richmond had one of the highest per capita murder rates in the country. And I'll cut to the chase and say that rather than continuing to uh, adopt a law enforcement uh, approach first, they called in Devone Bogan um, and the Office of Neighborhood Safety to really um, basically create a mentorship program for the young people that they believed were responsible for the majority of the homicides. And through providing those young people with daily positive contact and mentorship, a monthly stipend to support themselves and their families, and travel opportunities, they were able to, through that program, really um, drastically reduce the violence within the city of Richmond to change the relationship between those young men and their um, supposed rivals in different neighborhoods. And that had a huge impact, not just for those young men, but also for the city as a whole, because now mothers and grandmothers could take their kids to the park and business and shopkeepers could keep their doors open much longer. And so it had a huge beneficial impact for the city as a whole. And those are the kinds of models that I think should be funded. And even today, despite all of that success, that program is, is funded to the tune of like $1 million versus the Richmond Police Department, which is some $60 million annually. And so when we talk about defunding the police, it's really about resetting and, um, and, and shifting our priorities towards actually um, addressing the root causes of issues from violence to drug abuse to other issues that impact our communities. And that's what I got for that question. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was great, Zach. Thank you so much. Um, definitely. I really, really appreciate all that you shared um, with the pieces around like economic development and tying that also to like the environmental piece, which I feel like is often uh, overlooked in terms of like being in relation to policing. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn my camera back on here. And um, for folks that have not had the opportunity uh, to yet buy the book, um, you can go to Zach's website, zachnorris.com, to buy it. Um, if you're wanting to support uh, local uh, bookstores, you can definitely go to Powell's, which I think is finally open again, but probably safer just to do it online. Um, but I think uh, that uh, is definitely the cue to kind of like roll into um, as we're talking about solutions, to hear a little bit about what's happening on the ground here in Portland in terms of responding to um, community safety and everything we've been doing to this point. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Denasia. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction of Denasia as well. Um, Denasia Preston, uh, pronouns she, they, is a Black non-binary queer femme, born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. Um, she was first introduced to activism when gentrification started in North Portland, forcing them, their two brothers and their mom to move to Northeast. A historically black owned and operated neighborhood, North Portland no longer resembles home. Tanasia has been part of Emoja Kijana Shuja for four years, first introduced to the program in her senior year in high school. Over the last several years, she has focused on liberating the Black community, whether it be through emotional, social, economic, and educational means. When Denasia is not attending PCC, she enjoys singing, songwriting, skating, going to concerts, and being in nature. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Denasia, to tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about um, the work that you have been doing with Emoja and all of that good stuff. Um, okay. Hello. My name is Denasia. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm an organizer with Emoja. Um, to give some background, Emoja Kijana Shuja started as a Black youth paid summer program started by Baba Tunde, who you just heard from, our amazing mentor and friend who you all heard from a few minutes ago. Um, Emoja Kijana Shuja directly translates to uh, Unity Youth Warriors in Swahili. Um, I've been a part of Emoja for almost four years now, um, since it was just like a baby program in 2017. Uh, we started with a group of around eight 
people in a small boardroom learning basic strategic organizing skills and rights that we had as youth. Um, Emoja has since over the years grown to be filled with brilliant black youth um, ages like 13 to 25 as we added new people every year to join us. Um, we sit at about 15 plus students now um, and it has been a home to various different identities within the black diaspora um, and has held a place for radical learning, thinking and dialogue. Um, we as black youth have ground ourselves in abolitionist values and brainstormed ideas and solutions of what liberation feels and looks like when it includes all of our identities um, and every year have put those visions into practice when planning Night Out for Safety and Liberation. Since 2017, um, we have hosted Night Out uh, for Safety and Liberation and Solidarity with the Ella Baker Center, an event that directly combats white supremacy and policing in our neighborhoods and provides a place for our communities to open conversations of what real safety looks like outside of a carceral system. Um, while we focus heavily on radicalizing Black youth, we also put a lot of pressure on community healing, uh, meaning showing up and taking care of each other. Every single summer that um, we show up to Emoja, we didn't just come back to a space where people looked like us, um, but it was also a safe space where we created a family. And every year that we partnered with other amazing people, they were also added to that family. Um, we meditated together, um, we were fed, and I mean good, we were always eating good. Um, we were paid living wages and giving free transportation to and from work. And of course, we always laughed almost a little too much. Um, we have been blessed over the years to travel together for the first time. Uh, we went to New York and later to Boston to further our learning and divestment and campaigning skills. Um, with national friends and comrades. Um, a lot of the students recruited to Emoja um, have collective wounds on what it's like to be a youth with intersecting identities um, and exist in navigating this city, not only through the school systems, but in jobs um, on transportation in our own neighborhoods and uh, streets and the list goes on. Um, growing, growing up and living in Portland is all around a pretty unique experience and it can be challenging to navigate who to call or um, what resources are available to you and what to do when we're so often confronted with racial violence and internalized um, pressures to conform to colonial values. Um, in this city, we are repeatedly gaslit um, about our experiences and in Emoja, we were there to feel heard and very validated um, and have our livelihood and our minds invested in. Um, there's so much beauty, like so much beauty um, in the Black life and in Black youth and all that we encompass. And this definitely radiates when we talk, when you talk to any Emoja youth. Um, we are resourceful individuals and Emoja is where we get to bring all of our strengths together and create a world for ourselves um, and anyone that comes after us. Night Out for Safety and Liberation is the place that we ignite this change in Portland and learn how we as a whole can combat the way that the state neglects to put Black safety um, and healing as a priority and finally define for ourselves how to protect and heal each other uh, without further harm or re-traumatizing. In the past three years um, of Emoja, we have hosted Night Out for Safety um, as an invite-only event because of constant fear uh, for our safety. This year, for the first time, we are going public with this event um, to provide mutual aid and care to our community. As we have all seen, there's a huge um, call lately for defunding and um, abolition work uh, to be pushed. Um, 
I believe that events like Night Out for Safety and Liberation are important for providing a visual of what it looks like to exist outside of state-defined community safety, uh, policing, criminalization, and punishment as a response to socioeconomic needs and a lack of accessible resources. Currently, me and, and another amazing community member and organizer and friend, Tana, along with Baba Tunde, have created a team to transform what Emoja looks like um, in the upcoming years. We've joined other amazing teams such as Portland United Against Hate, uh, PUA for short, uh, to give voice to those who have been victims of um, violence in Portland. We are also a part of Measure 110 Coalition, working to ensure that those who are struggling with addiction have the resources they need to be safe and recover if they choose. Um, we also have been working with Safe City PDX to ban facial recognizing technology, which is known to carry the same white supremacist biases as the people who are creating them. Um, we have testified and furthered our learning and knowledge on facial recognition technology and how when unregulated, it is used to discriminate and further police and criminalize their communities at very disproportionate rates compared to our white counterparts. Um, we strive heavily to always center in on providing safety and stability to black trans and gender non-conforming youth which was limited to the summer for a very long time. Um, but recently we have started crowdfunding on GoFundMe so that our mutual aid can go year round for all students that have been involved with us uh, now and into the future. The GoFundMe has a large goal because we are hoping to use this money to sustain our work um, as well as continue to offer stipends to our participants and start a mutual aid fund for black trans folks. Um, feel free to go check out the link to it. Um, it is definitely plastered on all our social medias. Thanks for Tune Day for getting on us every day to talk about it. Um, it's on <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and show us some support, of course, and give us a follow and some likes and share. Um, we'll drop our link tree into the chat. We appreciate it always. And again, my name is Denasia and my pronouns are she, they. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Denasia. That was wonderful. Um, I'm really, really excited to continue to be working with y'all um, through everything. Um, I'm like, okay, there we go. Y'all can see me now. Um, yeah, so I guess to uh, kind of remind me, I'm like a little bit distracted by like the yellow outside right now. Um, but uh, Denasia mentioned the night out for safety and liberation quite a few times. And I was wondering if I could uh, pass it back to you, Zach, to maybe have you talk a little bit about like the essence of the night out for safety or liberation and how that all came to be. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Abatunde, and thank you, Denasia. Um, Night Out for Safety and Liberation really started uh, after the murder of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman, a self-proclaimed uh, neighborhood watch captain. Um, we started it because we believe that this idea of safety rooted in suspicion and fear wasn't really about safety at all. Um, every year since I think 1984, folks um, associated with the National uh, Town Watch, I think, believe it's called, um, have held uh, events called National Night Out. And we believe, or I believe, that the spirit of those events are not wrong in the sense of community members coming out to reclaim safety, um, but the, the execution of that um, vision, and I use that word intentionally, the execution of that vision of safety has been all the way off. Um, police officers come out and say, you're the eyes and ears of the police. They say, if you see something, say something. And quite frankly, it is that vision of um, safety rooted in suspicion that resulted in the death of Trayvon Martin, among so many others as, 
as we know. And so we decided um, to really try to create an event that would lift up what safety looks like when really done in the interest of community members. Um, and to really call attention to the fact that human beings have more than eyes and ears. We have hearts, we have hands, we have minds, and we can use all of those things to contribute to community safety. When we offer a formerly incarcerated person a job, when we mentor a young person, when we create collectives that um, protect the integrity of gender non-conforming folks or trans folks who just want to be able to um, walk outside in their full humanity and not be demonized um, and not be victimized. And so um, what I've been proud of is the diversity of um, the ways in which people have taken up Night Out for Safety and Liberation from doing direct actions, calling attention to ongoing state violence, to people just coming together um, in, in places like New Mexico to say, yes, we're going to create space to, to hold each other. Um, uh, to restaurant workers in New York City and other places saying, you know what, if I can't put food on my table while I'm putting food on your table, then I'm not safe. Really lifting up um, the ways in which safety is tied to economic justice and racial justice and gender justice. And I'm really uh, appreciative of uh, the leadership of folks in Portland. Um, and, and I say that broadly, both folks within government who have really looked to um, try to transform their kind of previously described as Neighborhood Crime Prevention Council, or at least that's what we call it here in Oakland, to adopting a different vision and model. And to the organizers in Portland who have held down some of the largest Night Out for Safety and Liberation events um, without even making them public, right? So just shout out to Baba Tunde and to so many others. Um, who helped lead that work. Um, and I'll close by just asking, you know, people to, to sign up because um, whether or not you're um, participating in the events that Danesia and others are helping to lead or creating, you know, events in your own neighborhood, there's an opportunity this year on October 6th to really put forward a different vision of safety. And people can do that by going to NOSL dot us that is n o s l dot us to sign up um and i'll just say like we're doing this on october 6 for a reason right we're not doing it in the first tuesday of august because uh quite frankly we aren't safe we have invested in this model in the united states which isn't a model of suspicion and fear and removing people to faraway prisons as supposedly being about safety. And we have not invested in a public health infrastructure. And so if we had done that, if we had invested in a public health infrastructure, we might not need to be having night out for safety and liberation in October. We might have been able to have it in community outside in the first Tuesday of August as it normally happens, right? And so we are a country that has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. We produce 25% of the world's pollution or CO2. And now we have 25% of the world's COVID deaths. And those things are related because we haven't um, prioritized really taking care of people and the planet. And we have a president who represents the epitome of the destruction of people and planet. And so we need to really lift up October 6th as an opportunity to lift up that vision of safety that actually keeps all of us safe. And it's an incredibly important opportunity to do it this year, October 6th, just a month before the election. So I really encourage people to get involved in Night Out for Safety and Liberation and to help remind our neighbors that, hey, we can't take care of public safety if we don't take care of the public. And we have to recognize all of us in all of our diversity as members of that public. So thank you. So that's my commercial for Night Out. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good commercial. That was good. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Thank you, Zach. Awesome.
Yeah, I I am very, very excited about Night Out this year. I'm definitely going to be a little bit different, but um, I think we're all just kind of rolling with the punches at this point. Um, I know that uh, I believe Denasia had a question uh, that they wanted to pose. I also wanted to encourage other folks um, in the chat, if you have any questions right now, to just put them in there. Um, if not, um, we have a couple of other, I think Tana also has a question as well. But um, yeah, I think uh, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Denasia, to uh, pose the first question to folks on the panel. Okay, so my first question is for Zach. Um, how do we use policy that can be repealed to, that can be, yeah, repealed to protect people um, who are seen as disposable to society. Um, sorry, just coming off mute and video, apologies. Um, I really appreciate that question. I think, um, you know, we helped to close down five youth prisons across the state of California, as Bob Batunde lifted up in the uh, my intro, um, and we did so um, by lifting up what we call kind of a truth and reinvestment agenda. First, we lifted up the truth: hey, this system isn't working. Like three out of four young people are being rearrested within one year. You're spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars per year per young person on this system, um, and uh, we need uh, to reinvest these resources. We also lifted up the truth that um, these were young people who were being demonized, um, who were being called super predators, their moms were being called welfare queens, and we challenged the mythology um, by actually bringing families to the Capitol and showing the links to which mothers and grandmothers were going to support their children and grandchildren. And that helped disabuse legislators of those stereotypes. Um, this country has such a long history of separating families. And when you separate families, it makes it easier to demonize individuals, right? And so by bringing policymakers um, to understand that, hey, we are whole families, we are whole communities who have been impacted by your policies, we can then challenge them to change those policies. And I want to, you know, just shout out all of the different policymakers who are on this call, as I understand it, from the fire chief to the director of emergency communication, some of the folks who oversee the public safety bureaus, because I think it is through this dialogue that we can actually begin to um, pinpoint what are those policies that can be changed, but I don't think it can be done in, until people really address that that question head on in terms of who's deserving and who's undeserving, right? And um, and you can do that not, not just through policy, right, but you have to do it through the organizing. You have to do it through actually forcing people to deal with our humanity as members of families and members of communities. Um, I don't know if that um, answers the question, and 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 I'd be curious to hear Tana's perspective as well. I know that y'all have been doing amazing work. Yeah, Tana, Denatia, do y'all have anything y'all want to add to that to kind of like um, speak to uh, the disposability that people seem to think for certain demographics and how that has impacted folks in Portland? I know that. Santa, you've named like living in East County. Um, Denasia, you've been at David Douglas. I'm just curious about like if y'all can speak to those experiences and how some of those policies break down or not. I mean, just bringing it to a place where we're talking about education and things like that. Um, I know that I experienced a lot of trouble when I was in high school because I would just wasn't able to hack it at the mainstream school. Um, and they were perfectly happy to just keep me like enrolled on paper so that they could keep accepting like money or whatever on my behalf and did literally nothing to advocate for me to get into the alternative school in the district. Um, so I feel like that's one example where we kind of just get like 
used for funding and then we don't receive any of the benefits of that. How about you, Denisha? I totally agree with that. Like in the education systems here, um, we are definitely like tokenized there. I know at the high school that I went to, it was a lot of talk about diversity and all these different things when we were experiencing racism every day that we came to school and we had to like create a caucus of black people to sit in one room because it just felt unsafe wherever we walked. Um, as well as like they didn't give us the resources to be successful in that school and a lot of my friends I had to watch not graduate and um, be sent to alternative schools as if we didn't deserve a chance to be there at all. Thank y'all for sharing that. Um, that perspective is very very important especially when we're talking about safety. I think that um, you know, one of the places that people expect to be safe is like while they're getting an education. And obviously that's not the reality. So I appreciate you lifting up your perspective. And I wonder like how we can bring that conversation even deeper for Night Out. Um, Tana, I know you had a question as well. So I wanted to create some space for you to um, ask that. Sure did, thank you, Papa Tunde. Um, this question is for Commissioner U Daly. I was wondering about what your vision is for the safety of the city of Portland. Just a sec, I was uh, reclining. <laughs> I need to set myself back up here. Oh, it happens all the time. I yes. Was, they put me on the spot right after I came back from the bathroom a minute ago, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm ready. I mean, my vision, I mean, I, I just, this book really resonates with me. Um, and it reminded me of a conversation that I had with then Chief Myers, uh, who was the fire chief and is now uh, the director of emergency management. And he asked me if I knew what the root cause of fire was. And I kind of laughed and I said, matches, knowing that that was not the answer. Um, but he said, no, it's poverty, addiction, and mental illness. And I consider part of my job as a fire chief, not to just be putting out the fires, but to be getting to those root causes. And so that is also my mission uh, in so much of the work that I do, whether it's housing justice, environmental justice, um, transportation justice, and definitely with this transformation of the crime prevention program to the community safety program. Um, every Portlander deserves to have a safe, stable, affordable roof over their head. Every Portlander deserves equitable educational opportunities. Every Portlander deserves economic opportunity and access to living wage jobs and affordable health insurance and just all the basic uh, needs that we've clearly been neglecting and are just so, you know, painfully clear in this moment of pandemic and economic meltdown and national reckoning with, with racial injustice. So, um, I mean, finally, I guess I'll just say that racial justice in, informs really all of the work that we do in my office and uh, through our bureaus. It's just so obvious to me that we have to focus on communities who have been historically underrepresented, the least and the least well served um, to truly do our jobs. So I really appreciate this opportunity to just hear um, from all of you and, and listen to Zach. Um, you know, I've faced some of my own challenges in life and, uh, but I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes um, as youth 
uh, black and brown youth and um, you're the best experts on your lives, your unique needs and challenges and what you need from, from your city and you deserve to be heard and you deserve to be, to feel safe. So thank you for the question um, and it's really nice to see you. It's been a little while. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me turn my camera back on. Okay, so we're getting uh, towards the end of our time together. Um, and so I wanted to just create a little space uh, briefly um, to uh, ask uh, Danasia and Tana a question. I know, I don't know if I'm supposed to be asking questions or not, but I'm gonna ask one anyway. Um, with uh, everyone um, on this call, the folks who are working for the city, um, some elected, um, what is it that you want all the people to know about how they can support um, the safety and protection of Black young folks and queer and trans folks? And that's either Tana or Janae. <laughs> I mean, I think we could both speak to this, honestly, because we do have different perspectives. But for me, I really do believe that the number one thing that y'all can do to support us is to listen to us and not like listen to us in the same way that you listen to your little like five year old kid when they're spouting nonsense just because it's good for their brain development, but actually deeply take in what we're saying and like do the work that it takes for you to understand where we're coming from, because we do have very valuable perspectives a lot of experience. It's constantly written off. Tanisha? I totally agree with that. Also, I think Portland is known for being extremely passive, and we hear this so many times, like to speak up. It's going to take more than Black Lives Matter signs. It's going to take more than these protests to make us feel safe. It's time to actually use your privilege to actually talk to the people. It's not unfriending the people because they don't have like common uh, politics with you. It's having the conversation that we don't get to have. Like we're not invited into those rooms to have those conversations. So it's your job to do that. And it's your job to educate yourself and listen to us so that you can do that. Okay, okay, okay. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right. Um, last bit of uh, conversation, I think I just wanted to share um, to what uh, Zach and Danesia and Tanner were talking about around Night Out for Safety and Liberation. Um, this year, we, uh, like we mentioned, we are going to be publicly announcing the event for the first time. Um, I think, you know, for us, uh, typically we've been able to turn out like roughly between two and 300 something plus people um, without social media and given the current climate, um, we do want to create a space that is opening and welcoming to all folks, but also maintaining safety um, given uh, the attacks by white supremacists that are popping off from multiple avenues of the city. Um, this year, um, I won't disclose the location uh, just yet, but this year we are really committed to um, practicing uh, a lot of um, safety in terms of like COVID pr protocols, uh, making sure that like we're hopefully going to be offering um, uh, COVID testing to folks, as well as potentially getting some flu shots for folks since this is going to be in October, um, whereas we've typically had the event outside um, the past few years. Um, I think everybody knows the weather in uh, Oregon can be a little bit unpredictable, so we're probably going to move that inside. Um, and this year we're uh, going to be having um, uh, food boxes go out as well, um, some entertainment from some of the local Black queer youth, um, as well as uh, providing resources for folks um, with like water filters, um, emergency preparedness kits and things like that. So really thinking about the ways that uh, our safety is changing constantly depending on our circumstances and that there's not one blanket thing of what safety can look like. So I did wanna share that. Um, I think, you know, the few kind of 
point I wanted to end on was just that ultimately uh, every single one of us on this planet um, is looking for uh, safety, belonging, and dignity. And I think that's really what the, is at the root of this conversation is figuring out what safety, belonging, and dignity looks like to each person um, and each community. I think um, it's been really, really amazing to like hear uh, from you, Zach, um, just directly about like kind of the, the history of how the book came to be and kind of some of the work that you're doing now. Um, I think it's really, really powerful that so many people joined us on this call, especially people who are working um, for the city and who have the ability to be able to enact a certain level of change um, in the day to day that directly will impact um, marginalized folks, black and brown folks, queer and trans folks. So I'm really, really thankful to be able to have shared this space uh, with everyone. Um, thank you, Denasia, Tana, Commissioner Udaley, Meg, Zach, um, everybody who joined us, the community of uh, civic life and community safety. Um, I appreciate everyone uh, joining us with us uh, to take part in this conversation. I feel like this probably will not be the end of this conversation and will lead to many more uh, dialogues happening um, as the days go on. But I really, really wanna say thank you so much for everyone joining us. Um, I don't know what it looks like where y'all are at right now, but I have been extremely distracted and uh, concerned about the yellow hue outside. So I hope that folks are able to stay safe um, hydrate. If you don't have an evacuation plan, definitely uh, get on that. Um, and yeah, I hope that everyone is going to take care of themselves. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. And hopefully seeing a lot. Well, I guess I haven't seen none of y'all. So I mean, y'all will see me at night out. <laughs> um, that's it. That's all I got. But uh, thank you, everyone. Again, thank you to uh, Commissioner New Daily, Denasia, Tana, Zach. Y'all have been uh, brilliant and shared a lot of wisdom. Oh, Meg as well. Don't thank you all. All right. Bye, y'all.